Welcome to the December 2020 Plantsman's Tour at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. I, I feeling like winter's arriving today. The seasons don't follow the calendar exactly. Having said that, um, the last week or two, we've finally seen some good fall color on some of the trees in the Arboretum. I'm standing in front of the uh, Korean maple, Acer Pseudus baldi that has more sun and color gray. It's a really beautiful leaf, um, much, much more um, intricate leaf than a Japanese maple. Here's a typical Japanese maple leaf and you see the Korean maple has many more divisions to leaf. It's a lot like um, Acer japonicum, um, but quite a bit different from Acer palmatum. It's native to uh, northeastern China, Korea, and the, the far east, eastern part of uh, Russia. So most likely an extremely cold tolerant maple. It's a small tree, 15 to 25 feet tall, and um, just gorgeous this time of year. I'm gonna take a few step backwards and- I'm gonna get the species here for, you had a question on the, the name and let's see if we can get it to focus down here. Pseudo Seboldiana, meaning the false Seabold maple. Um, and this is a subspecies Takasimens. So you see the common name on this label is uh, Takasimens maple, but the, the species as a whole is what I saw is called the Korean maple, though there are many maples native to uh, Korea. Is that good? Yep. And then Chris got it for him too, so that's great. Okay. So you were going then. Yeah. Um, a month ago when we did the Plantsman store, we highlighted the number of Mahonias. Um, we've only had a little bit of frost and only a few degrees of frost in the last month's time. So many Mahonias have continued um, blooming all month long. And this is one that we don't often see bloom really well because like so many of the Mahonias, they start blooming just about the time we have a uh, you know, really hard frost. But this is uh, Mahonia. I better look at, I'll grab the label. I think it's Okawanensis, if I remember correctly. Oikwakensis. Oh, Oikwakensis. Yeah, so okay. that's why we need the label, Tim, because. It reminds me of Okinawa, that's why. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And anytime you see that E-N-S-I-S -S ending to a word, that means from. And so this is from Oiwak, you know, I don't know where that is, um, but it's a place name. And this is one that Mark Weathington collected on a trip to China and, and Taiwan. 2008. Most of the evergreen plants are present year round, you know, there are some plants that are green through the winters, but dormant in the summer, they disappear in the summer. But um, So they have a presence in the garden all year round, but we really come to appreciate evergreens in the winter as herbaceous plants die to the ground and deciduous plants lose their leaves. The two uh, highlight each other. And in this area, we can grow so many different um, Ascodistros, the cast iron plants. Um, they got their name cast iron plants when they were grown as house plants in the Victorian era in, in dark, unheated uh, living rooms and such. Um, but in zone seven, so many of the species are winter hardy. And this is, um, I'll grab the label. <laughs> Ascodistra. Oblancifolia, Nagoya stars. Um, it's a robust grower and uh, reliably winter hardy in zone seven. This has been really vigorous for us. And a fern that um, is not evergreen, right? Um, this is the carrot fern, um, Onychium. 
Uh, yeah, here's the label. Onychium japonicum, despite having the specific epithet of japonica, meaning uh, from Japan, it's widespread in other parts of Asia. Um, the original plant of it um, was planted in the lath house where it grew very well. And um, plants planted in the lath house um, that's never meant to be their permanent location. Um, and if they succeed in the lath house and it's time to move them out into the arboretum, see how they deal with the real world. If anything, this lace, this carrot fern has done even better uh, planted out in the native soil without um, any extra irrigation. And the first time we transplanted it out of the lath house a couple summers ago, um, it was hot and dry and the plant never looked back. It just got better. It's a real pretty fern. Um, it's very high, highly dissected leaves look like it should be something that's difficult to grow, but it's been anything but a really beautiful, easy fern. I must well point this one out. Yep. Um, we could do a whole tour sometime of, of just these This is one of the most dramatic of the Aspergistra elati or one called snow, like the old variety um, tips to the leaves, but this has much, much more white uh, to the tips of the leaves than um, Asahi does, a really dramatic thing. These uh, white tipped ones, when they're freshly divided, often won't show that white variegation until they're settled in. So don't think you've gotten the wrong thing if your new plant turns up all green. This one leaf is interesting with the striping in it. Aspidistra is one of those that really prefer shade over sun. There are a lot of plants that will tolerate shade that will grow equally well in sun, but cast iron plants and rhodia, they, they always all get out and um, would, wouldn't die in the sun, but the foliage would be all uh, visible. I'm sorry. You know, you um, Mount Fuji or something like that. The, ro the rhodias are evergreen herbaceous perennials. And um, so many different cultivars, ones with pleated leaves or curled leaves and various degrees of variegation. Looks like we may have just lost Tim and Doug. We'll see if we can get them back real fast. Am I back now? Oh, I can hear you now, Tim. Can't see you oh, quite Chris. yet. Can you see us? Not quite yet, no. I wonder if it's just where we're at. Yeah, ever since you got to the Rodilla, it's been a little difficult um, seeing Doug. I wonder if it's fighting between my, oh, oh we're kind of dense here. So it might be fighting between the um, the wireless and um, my Verizon account. Yep, might, might be best to move on from this spot right here. Okay. Oh, is, there, is it labeled? <laughs> I'm just going to go over here so they can see that. Doug's getting the label for this one. Can you hear us now and see us? We can hear you, but Doug froze in the back of the Japanese garden. We haven't um, resumed video feed yet. Oh, it's coming back a little bit. Oh, we're not on video yet. Am I back? 
your uh, your back, but your bandwidth is uh, very low. Let me see here. Oh yeah, I'm getting good 4G and I'm not good wireless here. So, okay. You're just in a dead spot. Not sure if we can go here, Doug. Well, you know, it's, is it gonna work anywhere? It should, yeah, once we get out of here. Because okay. normally- and the, This can't be any more difficult a spot than the last house. We've done the yeah. last house many times. Might just be the day too. Can you hear us now, Chris? We can hear you fine, but your image has gone small, which means your bandwidth is low. You're also showing red bars. Oh, you just got big. Okay, so you're, you're now yellow. Okay, now we can go. Okay. Okay. Many um, Japanese painters have been selected for really good fall color, and this is a old cultivar, um, Osaka Suki. Um, let me, is that enough? Uh, and it, this is not by any means, but it, it did just color up the last week or so. Um, it's consistent around Thanksgiving. I often miss it when I'm away. What was the name of that one, Tim? Yes. Yes, Chris. Do you lose us again? I was just asking what the name of the plant was. Which one? Uh, the red one that he's talking about. Okay, that's an Acer palmatum. Osaka Suki. Osaka Suki. Probably after the city of Osaka. We might have to move on. Yeah, We're going to try somewhere else. See if we get better bandwidth somewhere else. One. Okay, let me check here. Okay, we got 4G, so um, we'll see. Let me go over here. Yeah. There aren't flowers on the other okay, so, okay, so so you just want to talk? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't need to be in the picture. Uh, fall through winter and early spring are the time for um, most camellias to bloom. This is a selection of Camellia japonica. It's a cultivar Tafuku Benton. Um, what Benton always refers to red. And um, let me know when you're done with the label. It's not great, but okay. Um, uh, many camellias with uh, striped flowers and, and such, not the ones that are blotched, but have what's referred to as a stutter gene, um, where the expression of the color is sort of random. These typically are, as you see on the flowers on the bush, are white petals with a pink center to the petals, but you see some flowers will be all red or half red and white. Probably occasionally you might find an all white flower, but um, it's a fun cultivar, starts early blooms for months through the winter. Um, there are a lot of buds and a cold night will can destroy the open flowers, but generally the clo tightly closed buds will open up in the next um, mild, mild spell. There's it's somewhat a slight variegation to the foliage. Seems to it actually nice shows up better on here than I think okay. it does in person. It um, seems to be a nice compact grower. Japonicas are often fairly slow growing and some are slower growing than others.
Yep. Uh, yeah, we'll go over here. Uh, I can a little bit. So, what Doug, well, let's see if I can get this to into view. It's blowing in the wind here, but this is an Aracaria. Uh, it's a hybrid between Aracaria aracana and Aracaria angustifolia. I believe it's an F2 hybrid, if I remember right, from when, I, when we got this from um, Tony Avent. Uh, several years ago, I, it must have been oh, probably 2011 or 10 or, or 10 or 11. It was planted here in uh, 2012 when we uh, were reopening the lath house. Um, earlier in the season, I noticed that it actually had some cones on it, and I went up and harvested one today. Unfortunately, they're dioecious, so um, this is not it was not pollinated. It's a female tree. We found out you have boys and girls, and uh, this is the first time we found out that she was a girl, um, but we don't have a mate for her. <laughs> but it is just really, the fruit is really cool, or the cone is really cool, even though it didn't uh, mature. I don't know how large these would get uh, and if they would ripen here. Um, some aracari are quite large and dangerous actually when they fall, um, but uh, just a really cool uh, cone. So one of its parents, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, Oricaria oricana is the monkey puzzle tree. And wh who was the second parent? Angustifolia. Okay. Oh, and I know Angustifolia it looks a lot like this. Yeah. Um, but uh, an Oricaria that you know quite well probably is the Norfolk Island pine. That's a used to be a fairly common house plant and probably is in garden centers now uh, being sold as a in indoor ha uh, Christmas tree. But um, fun conifer, conifer meaning to bear cones and that is quite a cone. When I first saw the fruit, Tim had picked them and they were in the building and I thought it was a young uh, jackfruit or one of the big tropical fruits that have real spiny skins to them. But then I saw the needles that are typical of an Araucaria. Do you mind if I set this down and not carry Here, it for the it. rest of the tour? You want me to put it in my pocket? Uh, it won't fall out. It's like Velcro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a big burr. Uh, Doug and Tim, we do have a question going back to the camellias. Okay. Um, someone asked if the stutter gene is responsible for the way camellia lady uh, uh, Vansenstart blooms. Yes, exactly. Lady Van Sitter is definitely a um, it does, expresses the exact same thing where the typical flower is white with the occasional red stripe, but then you'll have individual flowers that are all red or all white. Yeah, that, that is um, a typical of the striped camellias. Now, when you have a camellia with a blotchy flower, and I, I probably say this every time I talk about camellias, that is not a genetic, genetically controlled, that's caused by a virus. And camellia exhibitors often introduce that virus so they can produce those whiter pink flowers with white blotches. Uh, that virus is also expressed in some leaves that have um, irregular yellow markings in the leaf. Thank you, Doug. That was great. So is our reception better out here? It's been coming through nicely for the last couple of minutes. Looking so good. We know the, the back end of the Japanese garden is not good. <laughs> I'm going to go over here. Okay. Actually, let's see here. This is a uh, a little ornamental cherry. This is the uh, Fuji cherry, Prunus incisa. This cultivar is Shikizaki. It has a slightly weeping habit. And there's a second plant of this on the other side of the arboretum that has is much more heavily in bloom 
Well, we first started noticing flowers on this back in October and it will bloom through the winter um, well into our early spring. Um, a, a real severe cold spell will destroy open flowers, but then they, there'll be new flowers opened in the next mild spell. Um, you see, it's a fairly, sh it's quite wide. What is that? It may be about oh. 12, 15 feet wide. Yes, it's, it's very it's wide. It's maybe only about seven, seven feet tall at the most. I think these smaller um, cultivars of Prunus and Siza would be good for a breeding program to produce smaller ornamental cherries and maybe add a little bit more color to Prunus and Siza. It's, this is fairly typical white to very pale as pink. Uh, let's see, where shall we go from here? One we have to go. Hey, we're back to the Vincent Van Gogh, aren't we? Let's see. Yep. That's um, uh, Mary Ann says we look like Vincent Van Gogh paintings. It's a different one, supposedly. Isn't that interesting? They don't, they don't look like they could possibly be. The think of the, the variation in palmatum. I'll just quick say, um, our color trial beds might look weedy, but mostly what you're seeing are uh, cover crops that have been sown for uh, for the winter. Um, I believe what I'm seeing here are tillage radishes, a selection of radish that are, I guess there must be a lot like a daikon radish, where the really deep, large roots are used to break up the subsoil. Oh, I was hoping you weren't going to the, the berry poppin since I defruited uh, it earlier. <laughs> oh, the yellow one. Is that the one you're looking at? Or a red one? Okay, I can't tell from here. I'm blind right now. I have to stay close to Doug or I can't see what I'm looking at. I don't have my glasses on. Things with showy fruit through the winter months are a real uh, delight in the garden. This is a selection of a American holly, Ilex opaca. It is uh, Morgan gold. I had thought the fruit might be gold. Is the foliage gold at some point? I can't remember. It might flesh gold. Yeah, there's a one up there that uh, certainly all the new foliage. I think it's royal gold. flesh or something. Yeah, that's right, royal flesh. But this is Morgan gold, and um, there's so many hollies, evergreen and deciduous hollies that can be grown for uh, winter fruit display. But this is our native American holly that occurs from Massachusetts to Texas to central Florida. Um, and it's relatively slow growing, but eventually a, quite a large tree, I guess maybe 60 feet tall or so. We had some in the garden. They were probably that big and the trunks were probably three feet. Yeah. Um, it's, it's my favorite of the evergreen hollies, but um, not terribly readily available in the nursery trade because the nursery's going to need to, you know, have crops that come to maturity at a much quicker pace than American holly. But search it out. You can find it from mail order nurseries and such. Not necessarily this particular cultivar, but there's hundreds of different cultivars of American holly. They also have a dollar leaf and I think that might be. Yeah, yeah, certainly, you know, English holly is the classic Christmas holly and the leaf is very glossy um, but English holly does not grow well around here. I know years ago people at the Arboretum were grafting them onto 
Nellie R. Stevens. So they had a very uh, healthy root system to them, but I don't remember what the outcome of that was. And, um, you know, the Chinese hollies like Burford holly, um, horned holly um, have a glossier leaf. But this is a great one. Eventually the birds will strip the fruit and that's another reason to grow them to feed our birds. And um, Marianne, yes, Kim this will Dom. work on a wreath. <laughs> what were you gonna Kim ask? Yeah. The American Holly Society says that Morgan Gold has gold berries. Then we don't have Morgan Gold. Okay. We recently added canary to the Arboretum collection and that does have yellow fruit. Yeah, there's a number with yellow and orange fruit. Here at the Arboretum, we produce countless numbers of plants for the giveaway and plant sales and our little plant cart that's out twice a week. And conifers almost never sell well at all, which really, make, I, really makes me sad and I don't really understand why. Um, certainly many conifers get really large but there are so many dwarf selections. And um, I know a lot of people deal with deer. Um, deer will eat some conifers and not others, but um, a lot of the uh, cultivars have really interesting shapes that are beautiful sculptures year round, but again, they really stand out in the winter landscape. We were standing in front of a dwarf Japanese white pine Pinus parviflora, Gimborn's ideal. Then you have something like this. Um, um, let's see, that's probably now a either a xanthocypress or it could be a compressus. Yeah, it could yeah. be compressus. With a beautiful, you know, upright but weeping side branch habit. Just a beautiful sculpture. In the garden. They keep on changing the name on this one, so I'm not yeah. sure who it is right now. <laughs> and, you know, what so was the cultivar, Tim? I don't know if it's a Xanthocyperus nucicatensis or if it's Cupressus nucicatensis or Calotropsis nucicatensis. It's something nucicatensis. Yeah, but you know the cultivar name, or does it not have one? Uh, I don't know where the label's at. It's probably on the other side. Okay. It's either that or it. Oh, it is. I see it. And I don't, I think, oh, yeah, we're now calling them Cupressus again. And this is Green Arrow? Yeah, Green Arrow. Do you have a label? Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, oh, that's interesting. That's a Lawson Cypress. Yeah, and it's actually alive. Yeah, Lawson Cypress, native to the Pacific Northwest, usually don't do well here. And, this looks happy as all can be. Um, it's Chemicypris lawsoniana imbricata pendula. Very striking growth habit. Now add a few sculptures to your garden. They don't have to be made out of bathtubs or barbed wire. You could uh, you know, grow living sculptures. No, that one's not grafted as far as I know. That's on its own roots. Yeah. Of course, not all not all conifers are evergreen. Here's a beautiful uh, selection of Dawn Redwood, Miss Grace. Um, probably even more striking in the in its winter form than in the summer with foliage. Mary Ann asked if conifers uh, will take part shade, and yes, some of them will do perfectly fine. Some of them went full sun to do best, but uh, like a lot of the Chemociparus, um, Arborvitae will actually take part shade, not full shade. Uh, Podocarpus, um, 
hemlocks definitely um there's actually again there's quite a few you can actually um, get into part shade and actually this one that, low taxes, yeah taxes. definitely they'll take the shade to part shade yeah. um this uh meta sequoia actually i think would be better in part shade this is uh miss grace and she's she's a pale one and she's not always happy in full sun i've killed her a few times but this one's doing okay um she can burn if we have hot dry weather part shade would be good for her. tim across the Field. Can you see those hibiscus? Yeah, I love the stalks. Yeah, um, you know the the winter forms of a lot of herbaceous perennials are are very beautiful, and uh, across the color trials on the far side, you see the almost silvery stems of a herbaceous hibiscus. You know we grow those for the huge flowers that bloom for months in the summer, but I enjoy seeing those stems all winter. It's also important in, in gardens not to clean up the whole garden too quickly because a lot of beneficial insects overwinter in, in the garden litter and in the stems of plants. But those hibiscus will leave standing until like February or March and then we'll cut them down. All right, shall we go to the year? Yep. Holding on a little bit. It might not go beyond tonight. <laughs> Do we need a close up of the hibiscus? We can. We can go that direction. Oh, they're doing video over there too, it seems like, I think. Or maybe not. They're talking to Bernadette. I think that's Bernadette. I don't have my glasses again. I have to go by shape. and. <laughs> Tim? Yes. We had a double question from Marilyn about the green arrow. Yeah. She's wondering, um, does it want sun or can it take some shade? And how tall will it get? Part shade. And I don't know how tall it gets. Sometimes um, the xanthocypress can get pretty tall. I haven't found that they're very happy in our climate. I see them xanthocypress or Cupressus nucicatensis back home in Western Pennsylvania and they're happy as a clam or in the Pacific Northwest where they're native, they grow into enormous trees. Um, green arrow, I think should be rather rather thin and upright, maybe 15 yeah. to 20 feet, yeah. but um, it's gonna take a long time to get that in our climate. I think I've seen them in photographs of Dan Hinckley's mm -hmm. garden where they're very narrow, very yeah. tall and very narrow, sort of. There's a couple different like cultivars. This, weeping like this. Yes. Well, that's true. But weeping plants often come true from seed, and so maybe they have a bunch of different selections. Tim and Doug? Yes. Wasn't that a green arrow outside of my office for a good number of years? No, that was um, oh. not Jubilee. Oh, I yeah. Can't remember. Um, it was something like that. Um, or was it Jubilee? I think it was Jubilee, but they're, okay. they're kind of similar, aren't they? Because that did well for a good number of years and looked like and it was. And then all of a sudden, it, it went and it never got real tall. It was never vigorous. It's one of the parent Nobody species grew. of Leyland Cypress, actually. Yep. I don't remember this being bold. Oh, I don't either. Um, Camellia sasanqua and uh, Camellia pimalis. Uh, are fall blooming camellias. God, this one is loaded with flowers and generally they will continue to bloom up until a hard frost and then hard frost will be the end of their uh, bloom display. Um, this one is just a picture of perfection today. It's a, um, there's a series of new camellias in the uh, October Magic uh, series. This is actually October Magic carpet um, and I don't, it doesn't look like it has been given a, well, it's, it's cultivar name is green 01-006. Lovely name. Lovely name. Um, but this is a fairly compact growing one. And amongst the Sasanku camellias are a, a number of worthwhile growth habits. There's low growing ones like this, and there's uh, columnar ones that are, you know, really good for vertical accents in the garden or for a hedge. Um, and then these ones are with green in it. They're from uh, a very fine camellia expert, Bobby Green, uh, Green Nurseries in Fairhope, Alabama. I don't, 
Tim and I just agreed. We don't. It's odd. This. I don't remember them have, being open center. No, like they're this. so frilly. You know, usually they were the center of the flower in previous years was full of petals. I love this form. Looks like uh, some of the single peonies. Yes, yes, it reminds me of that. that big um, our native um, uh, witch hazel, Hamamelis vernalis, is either blooming or done blooming already at this time of year, but this is one of the winter blooming uh, witch hazels, one of the intermediate hybrids, but you can see all the flower buds that'll open all any time from December into uh, March or so. I noticed that um, the uh, cultivar Wisley Supreme is starting to bloom already, but that one's absolutely amazing because it blooms for months and months. Do we need to move a golf cart? I think we can get away without okay. it. We're gonna get some others in the view here. This one's a little uh, late for Halloween. It's, yeah. Looks like it's a pumpkin tree. It's a pumpkin tree. Um, it, you know, a lot of people are interested in growing their own food. Um, some of our most common fruits like apples and peaches are really difficult to grow. Are, no, they're not difficult to grow, but it's really, you have to work hard to get worthwhile fruit because they're so disease prone that you need to spray them. That's a, it's a lot like growing hybrid tea roses. But then there are a number of fruiting plants that are almost foolproof. Things like figs and blueberries and um, uh, pineapple guava. But this is a, a Japanese persimmon, uh, Diosporus khaki, the dios or dios in the name referring to God. God's food or God's, you know, food of the gods. Um, this is a selection called Shiba Michi Weeping. Uh, Mr. Shiba Michi must be an absolutely magical person, a Japanese uh, nurseryman who, you know, people have said of his nursery, if you don't like this with green leaves, we can find you one with purple leaves. If you don't like it with a broad shedding, spreading habit, we can find you one with a columnar habit, but he um, introduced this weeping form. Um, it, they're generally self-fertile, self so this produced all this fruit without another individual in the area. Now, I've eaten the fruit several times this fall, and even when they get to the stage where they're becoming more sort of red-orange, they're still fairly astringent. So. I tend to think that um, this was introduced primarily for its growth habit and the quality of the fruit is not top quality, but sure makes a beautiful display. Um, but if you wanted to grow Japanese persimmon for uh, quality fruit, then you would buy one of the selections that is grown specifically for the fruit. And uh, I've seen, name cultivars fruit heavily like this. I don't know if there'd be any value in thinning them early on so the fruit would be bigger, fewer, but bigger fruit. But th these are not small fruit. They're no. No, two or three times the size of our native persimmon. Our native persimmon is also worth growing. Um, but again, I would select varieties that were chosen for good uh, fruit quality. You said this one has seeds too, doesn't it? Yeah, um, this one has a few seeds. I don't think, I don't know if I put my Well, I got all pretty for this tour, so I changed my pants and um, I didn't put my pocket knife in my pants, but. In my Felcos? No, I've, here, I've exposed a seed. The commercial varieties of Japanese persimmon, like you would show up in a fruit, um, in the grocery store generally don't have any seed at all. This doesn't have many seed, but you see it's a great big seed. That's one seed there. Um, our native persimmons usually have a lot of seeds. You sometimes see, you know, where or some wild creature has eaten a bunch of persimmon mm -hmm. seed in 
you have all those penny size fruit. Yeah, this one fruit has um, three big seeds. Um, I guess you could, you know, they might, this, these would be worth growing from Let's seed. See if they're we reaping. Might, we might get a weeping. And then we might not have, unfortunately, this is grafted and the rootstock wants to sucker. And I think it's yeah. the American persimmon rootstock. And I just ate a little bit of this <laughs> and it's fairly tasty, not super tasty, but I definitely have a, you know, cotton ball stuffed in my mouth sensation. I probably shouldn't do it while I'm trying to <laughs> talk clearly. What do we have here? Is this... Um, I'm not sure what it is. It's a little, it's an asteraceae. It flowered last year. Is that um, Mache? M-A-C-H-E? I don't know. It was um, something I wasn't familiar with. Yeah. And it's been winter hardy and it flowers yeah. the, the following spring. Where's Elizabeth? I don't think she it? knew what it was. I think well, it was something uh, that... Um, Ralph probably no, said. No. Um, Oh. oh, Rachel? Ra yes, Rachel planted. Yeah, okay. And there was just one or two of them here. I think I've never seen it except in seed catalogs, but I wonder if this is the little winter vegetable. And I don't know how you pronounce M A C H E, but maybe somebody in the audience can say um, that's what it is. But I'll, I'll save eating it for another day. <laughs> The flowers on Fatsias, again, we don't typically see them bloom as well as this because we usually have hard frost long before December 1st, but um, they'll keep on blooming up until frost stops them. This is the um, Japanese Aurelia Fatsia japonica. On a warmer day, the honeybees and other pollinators would be all over those flowers. Him and Doug? Yes. We had a couple of questions going back just a bit. Okay. Marianne asked Do uh, birds or other wildlife eat the uh, persimmon? Fox, I think, have in the past in the garden. Um, I don't know. The, there's some that have pecked holes in them on here. So I'm guessing some birds have been going after them too. I would think if, if they were going to eat them, they would have taken a bunch by now. Most of them are still on the plant. If we still had coyotes in the arbor, yeah. they might have stripped them off then. I wouldn't be surprised if raccoon. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And the other question goes back to the camellia. Uh, Lily, yeah. Lily commented and then asked, last spring, Edgeworth, you had very few flowers. This year, a lot of buds. And that's also on camellias. Could the cause be the hot fall we had last year? I don't know. I We had good bud set last year, but then it seemed like um, we had a lot of bud drop on our Edgeworthias last year. And we thought it might have been that real sharp cold we had in November before they were hardened off. Yeah, that's, I mean, um, yeah, some of them will get damaged and when they aren't hardened is right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. The uh, beauty berries, Calicarpha, many of those are more of a fall display rather than a winter display, but this is one of the many species of calicarpa native to uh, Asia. This is one we don't have a species on in it. China. <laughs> like this seems, looks a lot like calicarpa rubella that we've grown from seeds from other collections Mark has made. The leaves are quite fuzzy. Sometimes they're sort of clammy, you know, sticky. Um, but we've seen this fruit, you know, a number of years now, and the fruit often persists well into the winter months. Um, we, things like Calicarpa americana are largely no longer showy because either the birds have stripped all the fruit off or uh, the, the fruit shrivel with a hard frost. Yeah, this is when we've been eyeing the last couple of years. We have two seedlings along the yurt and they're fruiting beautifully. We don't know which one this is, right? Nope. It's Mark collected it. It's a spa.
You just you just had someone say that they'd love to see that one in the plant giveaway in the future. That calicarpa? Yep. Yeah. We're not sure if it sets fruit really well because there's multiples there or if it's just those plant that species. Because we've had other calicarpas that set no fruit and they're isolated. So And you can see the road construction, destruction behind us. Yeah. <laughs> um, you want to hold that up or you got it? I can get it. Yeah. This is uh, Camellia ex vernalis egal pink halo. Um, Camellia vernalis, the, the Camellia vernalis are hybrids between. Camellia sasanqua and Camellia japonica. Camellia sasanqua is the more sun you give it, the happier it's going to be and the more heavily it's going to bloom. Uh, Camellia vernalis will take full sun as well. This is far from being full sun here and it's doing fine. It's a young plant. Um, but Camellia vernalis is much faster growing than Camellia japonica. They will often bloom all winter long. Maybe we'll get a chance to uh, look at um, Dawn, Jinryu. Okay, yeah, that's flowering, um, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, Igao is Chinese for smile. Um, the, the original Igao is uh, more evenly blush pink, not zoned like this one. And there's a number of other selections of um, Igao, like corkscrew Igao that has twisty stems like a um, cuddly, like a curly willow. Yeah, probably that's the best colored one there. Yeah, a younger flower. I really like the Vernalis. The Vernalis hybrids will continue blooming all winter, whereas the Sasanquas will stop once the weather turns cold. You said winter garden at some point. Oh, and we were talking about hollies. This one right above us, this is an unnamed cornuda that's been in the garden for years. I'll get back here so you can see it. It's just loaded with berries. It's just always covered with berries almost every year. And the foliage is such a beautiful dark green. I was pruning from it this morning for the wreaths, so. We cut all the fruit off. And we have a few magnolias in blossom. Where? Right here on the stellata and over here on cuensis, they both have some blossoms on them. <laughs> oh, that cuensis? Yeah. Okay. Is that a uh, I can't remember who's in cuensis. Oh, I don't know. But. Right. I'm gonna just, you know, I'm, I love deciduous plants in the winter. So many of them have such beautiful branching structure. Um, I'm not a big fan of Magnolia stellata because the flowers look sort of like tattered toilet paper up on the tree. <laughs> but I've always loved Magnolia stellata and Magnolia solangiana and similar deciduous magnolias in the winter time. They're big fuzzy flower buds, um, look like pussy willows, and the trunk, not so much on this individual, but on other others, they're are fairly silvery. And to play one of those up against evergreen foliage is really a beautiful sight in the winter garden. So, you know, I, as much as I don't like cold weather, I, I love the garden in winter and the uh, contrast between deciduous and evergreen. <laughs> I don't know, but I didn't see what Chris typed, but Apparently, autocorrect uh, a change to Magnolia stellata into something else. It doesn't like stellata. It always does stellate. Oh, stellate. Okay, that makes sense. My favorite spell check correction is if you spell verbascum, the scientific name for mullins, 
it'll change it to verb scum. I think, uh, let's see, is this um, Dr. Menzies? Yeah. Um, this is a, a good um, Mahoney and Media to uh, stop by. Uh, I need to be close to you. It's so loud. <laughs> just. This is something JC planted long time ago, but you can see how big these hybrid magnolias get. This They're is Mahonia. Not, yeah, Mahonia. <laughs> um, this is not multiple plants. This is one plant. Oh, actually, yeah, or maybe there's two. two. But anyhow, you see how tall it is and how wide it is, but also how dramatic it is. Um, and this one, I'm not getting a fragrance today, but that either I'm coming down with COVID or um, I think it's because it's cold. Okay. Was, was that Arthur Menzies? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we showed this one, I think, a couple weeks ago, but everyone else, they should see it again. I showed volunteers this morning. The amazingly colored Camellia Sasanqua. Or Hamalis. Well, Hamalis. I don't know. I, I We talked a lot about Camellias a month ago. I don't and probably... Most of the attendees are the same from month to month. I don't know if I should go into that anymore. It's just, this has gotten better to me. Yeah. I've never seen it this blue this year. Yeah, this until is, this year. Uh, the, the cult of our name is Greens Blues, or Blue maybe. I think it's just Again, one. Again, um, Bobby Green from Fairhope, Alabama. And it doesn't show up for long this, well on the screen the way it's looking. Yeah. So we'll keep on going. Oh yeah, this is doing well today. Yeah, this is a hybrid magnolia. Or camellia. Oh uh, Lord, every, <laughs> everything's a magnolia today. I have magnoliaitis. Um, this is a hybrid camellia, camellia yume. The cult of our name is yume, Y-U-M-E. And yume is, um, means dream. And it's a hybrid between a uh, Sasanqua and another camellia. There are about 300 species, wild species of camellia. And its other parents is camellia ucnensis from Ucian um, province. Uh, with, and camellia ucnensis is white flowered and also extremely floriferous. And in some uh, individuals, very fragrant. But this is. Fairly, I know, I know you're not supposed to say fairly unique, but um, the petals often appear where they alternate between a white petal and the pink petal. I'm not seeing that all that. Almost here, today. but not quite. Yeah. Oh, if you look back there. But one of the very best camellia nurseries in, in the U.S. is Camellia Forest Nursery in um, Chapel Hill. And they sell both this and a seedling from this um, that uh, is also quite beautiful. The foliage is real handsome too. I didn't see that. What was Marianne asking? She asked, what is the Yume seedling it called? Doug couldn't remember, right? I couldn't remember. Go on the Camellia Forest Nursery website and um, you'll find it. I was looking up uh, camellias on their website yesterday because we spent the afternoon uh, yesterday planting camellias that were donated by Garden Treasures Nursery in Wendell. And I was on their website to find out the 
information I needed to know to how best use those particular camellias in the plantings here at the Arboretum. And I stumbled across that um, seedling of Yume. Doug and Tim, could that be yeah. Dream Quilt, maybe? What was it again? Dream Quilt. Dream Quilt. I remember that Dream was part of its two-part name, but it'll say right in the description that it's, it's a seedling of Yume. Yeah, it says seedling of Camellia Yume. Um, the Christmas roses, Lenten roses, and other hellebores are certainly plants of, of the winter garden. Um, this is hellebores fetidus. Fetid meaning, you know, smelling pleasant. If you brush the foliage, I can smell, you smell it. it. It's a sharp smell, sort of like um, if you've ever grown uh -oh. lettuce and had it bolt oh. and it gets real bitter. Did we? Are we still there, Chris? Hello, Chris. This will be the last time we're ever here. Hello, Chris. Are we still you're, here? I, you're, I see people, but I don't see my screen. You're good, Tim. Okay, can you see anything? Because I can't. Yep, Doug's near the hell of ours. Okay, I'm, I'm somehow got a different view. Let me see real quick. Well, if I can get back to my view. It's not showing me. What would I look to have so I can tell what I'm pointing at? <laughs> You're you pointing at Doug's feet in the center of the screen. Okay, but I mean, what could I do to get my screen back? Um, unfortunately, I'm not exactly sure what you did, Tim. Uh, <laughs> change your view. Do you need to go back to like speaker view or gallery view? Uh, I'm, I'm. Let's see here. My participants. I'm going to stop video for a moment. See if I restart video. Hmm. Participants. Disconnect audio chat tracing. Sitting. I don't know. Can you hear me, Chris? Yep, we can hear you. I can't see you. Okay. So, Doug, okay, start talking again, Doug, okay, about your fetus. I'm going to start talking. And I'll hopefully um, fiddle. Hellebore's fetidus is distinct from all other hellebores. Um, things like the Christmas rose and uh, Lenten rose, they produce the foliage and the flowers all from the subterranean crown of the plant. Fetidus has a stem, see this stem that's terminated this time of year by this big inflorescence you might be thinking that's going to be really pretty when it starts to bloom. Well, it's in full bloom today. This is how big the flowers get. They're green, often with a little red edge to the petal. Um, so you're probably thinking, well, why would you grow? Well, it's this beautiful architecture, the branched candelabra of flowers, um, the light, the spring green of the inflorescence, it really glows on a gray winter day. Um, the foliage is handsome, sometimes referred to as the bear's paw hellebore. I don't know. I guess it resembles the big claws of a bear's paw, um, a lovely dark green. Their life cycle is very different than the other hellebores. It's more of a live fast, die young lifestyle. Um, individual plants might bloom one one or two years and then they'll die of old age um, but they produce abundant number of seedlings to replace the plants that have died and the seedlings also transplant extremely readily so you can move them about the garden um, fastidious gardeners might find their seeding a, a bit too much but it's one of my favorite plants in the winter garden and i love the fact that you can transplant it so readily I've got a view, but I'm still, uh, uh, it's small for me, but I'll see what we can do. That's good. Uh, Doug and Tim? Yeah. 
Mary Ann commented that she's been told that it repels deer and rabbits. Any comments? I don't know. I doubt they'll eat them. Um, I don't know about repel. Deer don't and rabbits generally don't do eat hellebores, but I've also known deer to eat hellebores. In a client's garden, the deer stopped eating daylilies um, one summer. And it was the first time in six years in that garden that I saw the daylilies bloom. But that was also the year that they started eating hellebores. So that's one of the reasons why I'm always reluctant to talk about what deer do and do not eat because it changes at times and it differs from garden to garden. I don't know of anything that would repel a deer us and keep them out of the garden. And, you know, I think deer will eat almost anything if they're hungry enough. They eat their favorite things first. They're no different than we are when we're, you know, at a buffet. Looks like Tim is still experimenting with trying to get himself back. We'll have him back in just a moment. Okay, so start my video. They're not seeing video. I'm not sure. Tim Tim muted himself and turned off his video. He's back. Oh, sorry. No worries. Am I on video now? Yes, you are. We can see Doug very nicely. He's in front of the Ponceris. Anything. Oh, now you're muted. Okay. I'm unmuted. You're good. Okay, I can't see, but okay. Um, Chris, did you did you hear all that uh, all the brilliant things I had to say about the trifoliate orange, or do I need to start over? Oh, there we go. Got my screen back. Yeah. Sadly, Doug, we did miss miss that brilliance, so you'll need to repeat that all over again. Okay. Um, there are a number of shrubs and trees we grow for their contorted stems and those are most evident when they are without leaves in the winter. Um, this is a contorted form of the trifoliate orange. The cultivar is flying dragon. You can see why they're called trifoliate orange. The leaves are divided into three leaflets. It is um, first cousin to the true citrus and can be hybridized with them, uh, which is often done because this is a very cold hardy plant, at least winter hardy into the New York City area. Um, I've seen it in Pittsburgh of all places, which oh, is even colder. Yeah, Pittsburgh's probably almost it's zone, zone five. Six. No, it's zone six. A cold zone six. Yeah. It's certainly colder than the New York City area. Um, but really beautiful contorted stems. Up above us is the contorted form of our native black locust. I would say don't ever plant a black locust unless <laughs> you want it to take over the whole garden because black locusts spread underground with rhizomatous uh, roots um, and they will, they're, they're grafted. This cultivar is grafted. So what comes up from the rhizomes are the wild type and it comes up in great distance from this plant, but what is this cultivar? Is it twisty? I think it's twisty, twisty baby. baby. I think yeah. something like that. And it is kind of fun in the winter, but um, it's too subtle for me. Maybe when it's younger. Well, and and the suckering habit is is not tolerable. The contorted hazel will be more dramatic come um, another few weeks when it sheds all its leaves. One aspect of it I really enjoy are the male catkins that are hang on the plant all winter. Uh, they will shed pollen, which will pollinate the female flowers in late winter. Um, Though I rarely ever see any nuts. I've never seen nuts on it. Have you ever? It seems like I saw it on the red leafed one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which turns green too quickly. Winter sweet. Um, it's another winter flowering deciduous shrub. Um, we have better selections that we might see as we continue our walk. 
It's um, Chimonanthus praecox, praecox meaning precocious. It's uh, very much a plant of December. Um, you know, years by when winter was harsher and uh, came earlier, this often had a nice bloom in um, mid to late December and then the winter would turn cold enough that that'd be the last you'd see of it. But with our more open winters, they often bloom well into January. It's quite fragrant, even these flu few flowers. It's not my favorite fragrance, but um, the ones with bigger, yellow, more yellow flowers are quite showy. It's um, closely related to Calicanthus, the sweet Betsy, the spice bushes. Um, and the fruit, the fruit looks, looks very just much, identical yeah, almost. I couldn't tell the two apart. If you didn't know that the fruit, you wouldn't get Calicanthus fruit in the spring. <laughs> you wouldn't know. Tim? Yeah. Was the plant right before that, was that just the Harry Lauder's walking stick? Yes. yes. Thank you. Coriolis um, contorta, I mean, Coriolis avalana contorta. Um, we saw this Mahoney a month ago. This is uh, another Mahoney media hybrid, um, winter sun. Uh, I'm curious to what the flowers might look like tomorrow morning after 28 degrees. Oh, I think, I think they'll be okay to that. It's when we get in the low 20s that they sometimes have da damage on them. A couple days ago, this camellia was covered with flowers, but it was so windy yesterday. Um, They're all on the ground now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's one of the um, camellias in the winter series, which were bred for cold hardiness. Did I bother seeing anything? Uh, it's up to you. Here's the tail end of, I think, is this Angustifolia? Yes. Uh, uh, Lindera Angustifolia. This is typically gorgeous for us right around Thanksgiving, the week or so before, and then the week of. So um, it's, it, 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 it's almost past, but there's still some great foliage on this thing. And this is one of the Linderas that will retain its foliage all winter long and not shed it until the buds swell in spring and cause it to shed, which um, I like the look. I know the English often have hedges of beech and by um, pruning them late in the year so the new flesh doesn't mature, those will retain their um, foliage through the winter months. And, you know, it's brown, it looks like winter, but it's a valid part of the winter experience. Oh, I see we have Algerian iris. Yep. Um, the Algerian iris, iris unguicularis, will start blooming by Thanksgiving and bloom all winter long whenever the weather is open. Um, I lost track of Carex phyllocephala. Now there's the variegated, yeah. which we should have, and then now we have the, the green has yeah. seeded in. This is a a carex, a sedge, that used to be more common in the nursery trade. This is carex phylocephala, the cultivar is sparkler. It's probably, this green leaf form of it is probably came from seed from yeah. this parent plant. But I love the texture. Fairly evergreen, this whorl of leaves is really fine and this is a great plant for a uh, shade garden. Um, I haven't seen it for sale for years. It used to be common. 20 years ago. That is Acer Mo or mono. mono, yes, Acer Mono. Yeah, and I think, let's see here. There we go. A maple with a sort of chubby, very, with a chubby leaf with very little lobing on it. 
Acer Mono, M-O-N-O. -O. It might have some other part to it. I don't remember. Some variety mono. Yeah. The, the records say Acer picked up variety mono. Yes. Yes. The painted maple. Oh, and here's the better colored. Yeah. There are selections of winter sweet with larger and, and more brightly colored flowers. This is one of them. It's, is it Ludius or Ludia? I never remember. Ludius. Ludius. Okay. Now, so this is Chimen oh, no. Chimenanthus uh, precox or Chimenanthus. Chimen Chimonanthus precox. I can never keep those two straight. Right. Chimonanthus um, is supposed to chionanthus. Yeah, this is chy uh, Chimonanthus um, precox uh, luteus. Yeah, and brighter yellow. Those two names, Chimonanthus and Chionanthus, both have the anthus end, which is flower. Chionanthus is the uh, fringe trees and i think that means snow flower and chimonanthus okay. probably means winter flower so I that think. makes sense like um yeah. uh chionodoxa chio oh, yeah snow yeah. you know we, we just saw um where is the snow the carrick sparkler which i said has been in the nursery trade well in my own experience i don't get out much but my own experience isn't widely available anymore. And this is a <laughs> lovely selection of Ilex cornuta, the Chinese horned holly, one called O Spring. Certainly variegated plants like this add a lot of color all through the winter months. But and it's it's a it's a one that you know is fairly friendly. It has just a very slight little point on the tip of the leaf. Yeah, there's some of the cornudas are actually quite vicious. Oh, <laughs> Even if they aren't um, uh, the the ones that have multiple spines, it's fine. The tip can be bad on some of them. That one's not bad at all. Doug and Tim? Yes. We had a special request. Someone would like to know, is there any Acer Grissium where you're walking? We passed one. But there's uh, another one over near the uh, lath house yeah. if we get over there. Yeah, when we, it's actually when we, a named one. When we um, go see the uh, Camellia Dawn, we'll be near it. Yep, yep. the honeysuckles are beginning to flower. Over here, just beginning to flower. Both Trapusii and Fragrantissima. You have to look, but they are flowering. Here's one. Okay. Let's see if I can get it in focus. Yeah, the winter honeysuckles. Tim mentioned there are two names. The wild winter honey. Oh, I smell it. One flower. No, no here's a couple more flowers up here. Um, the honeysuckles are in the genus Lonicera. Um, the wild winter honeysuckle is Lonicera fragrantissima. The isima ending meaning very and fragrantissima meaning very fragrant. And they do typically start in December and they will bloom all winter long into March. They're big coarse shrubs, not something that you want to put in the most visible spot um, perhaps, but certainly somewhere in the garden because they will perfume the garden for quite a distance. Um, Put it where the wind can blow through it in, in the winter. And carry the fragrance to you. Yeah, this, yeah, the other one we have in flower is um, Perpusii, which is a cross between Fragrantissima and Standishii. I didn't pay attention. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I, I'm going to turn everybody on their side. Yeah, this is the per Perpusii. And they look winter the same. Beauty. Yeah, they're hard to tell apart. Standishia has a long, narrow leaf and is sort of interesting from a textual con uh, standpoint. Oh, it's a good iris leaf. There's three or four iris flowering right now. Most of them are the yellows, though. We've uh, time traveled back to April and May, and this is uh, iris season. Um, this is Summer Olympics. Summer Olympics. 
yesterday's wind sort of battered the open flowers, but there's there are some old varieties of bearded iris that repeat bloom in the fall, but there's a tremendous um, emphasis in iris breeding to repeat, to produce repeat blooming ones. And there's many, many of them available if you go, if you buy from a mail order source, but some selections are more reliable um, repeat bloomers than others. Um, and this one also has that wonderful fragrance of the best of the bearded iris. Yeah, they just produce a long succession of escapes. And like so many of the repeat blooming fall things like the repeat blooming azaleas, they will bloom up until a hard frost stops them. Depending on, I think they're typically good to about 28, I think, without Probably. too much damage. So, yeah. so hopefully tonight they won't get decimated. Out of the shade. <laughs> saw that Camellia vernalis hybrid a little while ago, the Gal, I don't remember, Pink uh, Halo. Yeah. This is an old vernalis. Um, had, this one is labeled with its original cult, Japanese cultivar, Jinryu, which I think means silver dragon. In the nursery trade in this country, it's generally um, sold as Dawn, but um, you're supposed to retain a plant's original cultivar name, even if it's in another language. But if you go looking for it, you'll probably find it under Dawn. And I've known big old plants of this to bloom all winter long. The petals are, the flowers I think are really pretty with their fluted petals. Nice dark green plant. It's a robust grower, you know, it'll, this is a young plant will get very much bigger than this. And being a Vernalis, it'll grow in um, pretty much full sun too. This used to be sunnier. Yeah. I think the um, Liriodendron has slowed it down because this has been here longer than I've been working here now. That's good. Both of them actually. <laughs> the red ones are open, just the single ones. And the Koreans are opening now too. Yep. We're going to go see the paper bark maple now. It's a young one. This has only been planted for two years. Yeah, it was two years. I think last ago. year we planted it. And it's a cultivar. It's not just the straight species. And there aren't many cultivars of selections made of um, Acer grissium. So you can see where it gets its name paper bark maple. That is one of the outstanding features of this small maple. Um, this one was selected for good fall color to the foliage and we're seeing a little bit of it. Hmm. It was a um, bare root plant when it arrived in spring of last year. Um, and we worked hard to get it established because it had a very small root system for um, the size of the top of the plant. Tim did quite a bit of very judicious pruning. And it's actually grown. To bring it, um, it's small, it's top in better proportion to, to its small root system. Um, but I think we've gotten it established. Is that all one year's growth? I'm not sure. It might need two. Yeah, maybe two. But still those, that's yeah. where I trimmed it last year. I trimmed out this junk. I mean, it was really dense, um, had no form to it. Sets a lot of seed, and I don't know if things have changed in recent years, but historically, um, 
if you went through all the seeds on a paper bark maple in you know a cultivated one there'd be very few viable seeds this one is grafted don't i see a graft union down there yeah uh, it could be yeah because <laughs> i can't imagine that it's a uh, uh, cutting ground right uh -oh. A lot of maples are really hard to root. And being it's from J. Franklin Schmidt, it would be grafted. If it's, um, it is a maple that does fairly well in this area. I know there's a really large and very handsome specimen of it in a nursery in northern um, Durham County, North Carolina. We uh, saw this. Mahonia early on, early on in the, our tour. Just another specimen. Is this a different collection? Uh, yes, it's a different collection. Oh, nice. And it's a, yeah, this is from the previous, the next year after. Those other two, or the other ones over there are 08s. You get an even better sense of the growth habit of this plant. This is this one's leaves. it is. Yeah, it's fernier to me that yeah. way. It's more delicate. What you know what bed that was, Tim? Uh, it's one of the new border beds, and I don't remember what letter. It's just outside the laugh house. Yeah, it's right. Look for the Meta Sequoia, um, uh, oh, Norman, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, darn. I can't spit it out now. You, we both started to say it, and I can't spit it out. Sherman Nordlich. I don't know. We actually, there's some narcissus up here that are trying to flower almost, which we find ironic. There's some that were planted last year, and I'm not, I want to, I wonder if we got bulbs mixed in because I didn't think this one would flower this early, but we'll find out hopefully pretty soon because there's a few bud stalks that are ready to come out. Let's see if I can. Okay. I'm going to. You can see how There's much foliage couple. there is on these narcissus already. Um, there's quite a few species of narcissus, mostly native to Europe and the Mediterranean area. And um, it is typical of many plants of Mediterranean origin to grow through the winter months. So a lot of new gardeners, especially people that are new to gardening in this area and who come from colder climates are not used to seeing foliage on bulbs up already. Um, but again, you know, that's perfectly normal for a lot of bulbs. Um, the little Narcissus jonquilla and Narcissus bulbocodium and Cantabrigiense and other Narcissus produce their foliage in the fall. Um, other bulbs that have foliage in the fall are the grape hyacinths, Lascari. Um, we can go over and look at some other foliage. See who's popping up. I missed a cultivar name on that one. Was oh, it? It has odoratus on it, and so I'm not sure if it matches or not. I'll, I'm curious to see. There's two flower stalks, and if they okay. open, I'll be able to tell. Because I think they flowered, we planted them last fall, and I think they flowered well, in the those, spring. Those bulbs were part of that big donation yeah. from Brent and Becky's bulbs. And so they weren't even planted until, until January, until December and, and January. Yeah. Um, because they weren't received until late December or so. But this is... Um, Trigoletia. Yeah, this foliage is... Uh, well... I've always said tritalia, and I, I don't argue about the pronunciation. I just spit it out quickly. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, this plant won't bloom until probably about May, but it puts its foliage up now to make use of the sun and the rain that's available in the winter. If you if your grow if your origin is a Mediterranean climate, these are um, West Coast U.S., so like California and okay. um, Oregon, and of course they have that same type of Mediterranean climate. Yeah, so and. Um, Iphion, the star flower, is one of the first winter spring blooming bulbs that comes up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is um, all this grassy like foliage is Iphion. That's been up for months. 
And by time it blooms in... It'll start January, probably. Yeah. January, you know, the, February, March, April, these flower. The foliage will disappear probably by May. Um, so, you know, don't panic when you see things bloom. I've also known some people to use some of these bulbs with winter foliage to mark where um, other bulbs are planted so you don't accidentally dig up things that don't show up until spring. But it's normal for these things to have foliage now. And these are deer resistant. Yeah, the foliage. These are onions, yeah, relatives. These, these are, the iffions are um, in the same family as onion and garlic. Yeah, they had, sort of have a skunky, garlicky smell to them. My one of my favorite stories here at Arboretum. About a year or two years after I started working here, a guy came in with a bag full of iffion, and uh, his he said his wife wanted to figure uh, wanted to wanted to know how he get them out of the yard because she didn't like the smell of them. Um, whenever he mowed the grass, I told him he'd have to move. Because they're, they're, once you have them, they're, and to get them established, they're not easy to get rid of, especially in a lawn. These are from, uh, these will be present all winter. This is one of the evening primroses. And this is one of the evening primroses that earns the common name of evening primrose because the flowers don't open until about seven o'clock at night. And it's a biennial, so these big rosettes will persist all winter. It'll bloom next summer. And then once they've set their seed, they will die because they have completed their uh, growth, their life cycle. Um, so, you know, another thing that'll be green all winter. I think they're really spectacular just as rosettes. Yeah. Um, these were some seed from Nargs, and uh, I wasn't sure what we were getting out of them, and we planted them on a whim. And uh, they're doing very well. How are we doing for time? I don't know, but my battery's down to 15%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's 232. Was, was, was that Enothera uh, oculus? Or is that not in the database yet? No, it's not oculus. Um, I don't know what these are offhand. These are mapped, but these are in the new, it's in a new bed. It's one of the Lath House beds. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, it is. Glazoviana? Yes, Glazoviana, Chris. Um, but if you ha haven't had the experience of watching these open, they open quickly enough that you can stand there and, you know, a tight bud will, you know, over a matter of like less than a minute, they will sort of spiral open. It, it's purely, it's pure magic. Um, so, you know, they're worth planting just for the those few minutes of watching the flowers on the ones I'm familiar about this size. Chris came up with the common name yellow. large uh, flowered evening primrose, so okay. that works. Yeah. How a we do neighbor that? planted evening primrose this year, and I enjoyed them on my nightly walks. It was kind of fun watching them open as I walked by, and they do open rather quickly. Yes. I was wondering our time, Chris. I'm uh, running out of battery. The, the time is you are expired. Okay. You and your battery. It is two 232. Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank and you, Doug, and thank you, Tim, for everything today. And thank you to everyone for joining us. We'll see you next year, probably. <laughs> That's right. My God, it's December 1st already. <laughs>